And you're listening to Speaking of Jung. Jerome S. Bernstein is a clinical psychologist and Jungian analyst in private practice in Santa Fe, New Mexico. He earned his diploma in analytical psychology from the C.G. Jung Institute of New York, where he later served as vice chairman. He is the founding president of the C.G. Jung Analysts Association of the Greater Washington, D.C. metropolitan area and is now a senior faculty member of the C.G. Jung Institute of Santa Fe. Mr. Bernstein was an official in the U.S. Office of Economic Opportunity, has been a lobbyist on Capitol Hill, and a consultant to the mayor of New York and the governor of New Jersey, and has served on several White House task forces. In 1989, he published Power and Politics, the Psychology of Soviet-American Partnership, which argues that psychology, especially depth psychology, must play a dramatic role in international relations if humanity is to avoid self-annihilation. For more than 40 years, he has worked extensively with the Navajo and Hopi people. His analytic work has been influenced by Navajo healing through his 23-year collaborative clinical work with a traditional Navajo medicine man, He is co-editor, along with Philip Deloria, of the groundbreaking book C.G. Jung and the Sioux Traditions, written by Vine Deloria, Jr. In the summer of 2011, Mr. Bernstein organized the first clinical seminar with Jungian analysts, a Navajo medicine man, and a Navajo cultural translator, which was held on the Navajo reservation. His latest book, Living in the Borderland, The Evolution of Consciousness and the Challenge of Healing Trauma examines the psychological and clinical implications of the evolution of consciousness, looking at how the newly emerging borderland consciousness bridges the mind-body divide, and it is the subject of this episode. Our talk was recorded in person in Mr. Bernstein's home office in Santa Fe on Friday, December 29th, 2017. I've been practicing for mm. close to 45 years, mm. long time. And where I am now is in a different place than where I have been, uh, because everything you've talked about so far has been clinical work with individuals, mm-hmm. which, which I do. I s- still have my practice although it's much smaller, by choice. Uh, But my primary focus right now and going forward is um, taking Jungian theory into the world, into the collective. And one of the reasons why um, Jung is not Mm -hmm. well-known, you were talking about that earlier, um, is one, he's very difficult, and you reading Jung is hard. Yes. Not easy. Uh, and his theories are complex. Uh, but I would say a uh, major issue is that the Jungian collective, that is Jungian analysts worldwide and Jungian organizations, have not really focused they're just beginning to now focus on taking Jungian theory out into the world. Mm. Um, Most people, the vast majority of people go into Jungian training are people who, most of them are psychologists of one ilk or another. They're Mm. counselors or marriage and family therapists or whatever, nurses. Uh, but, But they're very oriented towards the healing professions in one form or another, uh, which in one sense is really appropriate and essential on the one hand. On the other hand, though, it, um, how to put it, uh, clinically, clinically it's right, but what is unique about Jungian theory more than any other discipline, psychological, uh, uh, theoretical 
field, psychological field, is that Jung's theories have profound implications for society as a whole and particularly for the collective. Most psychological uh, theories are aimed at the individual mm -hmm. and, and of course it's group therapy but it's focused on transforming the individual in terms of their um, individual life path mm -hmm. even even the group work. Okay. And Jung's theories, uh, I would say more than any other psychological school, have profound uh, potential for addressing and uh, healing slash remediating uh, some major problems in the collective. So right now, right now for the past. Well, really, the beginning of my borderland work, even though my book focuses on individual therapy, following the theory of borderland consciousness, um, that theory, from my perspective, emerges out of, um, out of uh, a, a psychic evolutionary process. Mm -hmm. That is, it goes beyond the individual. Mm -hmm. And what it represents is a different kind of um, of a psychic orientation to life that's trying to emerge right now. It's different. So when I talked in my book about uh, people being diagnosed as uh, pathological, where um, what they are experiencing is this new... Um, mm, new dimensions of psyche. It's not new dimensions of psyche. It's, it's the awareness is new. The, the psychic process itself is not, mm -hmm. but the awareness of, okay. of it is new. And because it's new, including to um, initially to the practitioner, the practitioner would misdiagnose it. And that's what I talk about in Chapter 2 in my mm -hmm. book. I think it's Chapter 2, yeah. Um, where, um, like, I, I, I talk about this particular woman that I work with who's named Anna in the Hannah, book. Hannah, yes. Yeah. And, um, you know, she was, she had been to a number of therapists and she had been diagnosed with borderline personality and a whole bunch of stuff. Um, which really wasn't very helpful to her mm -hmm. and wasn't very accurate in terms of her life experience because <clears throat> she was experiencing, experiencing dimensions of psyche yeah. that were not commonplace experiences for most people, but they were real. They weren't pathological. They were real. What was pathological was nobody would accept her experiences as real. So in a way, uh, the process was really uh, adding to and pushing her into pathology. Not that mm -hmm. she didn't have pathology, mm -hmm. she did. And the work was sorting what was pathological and what wasn't, because it was hard to discern. That was then. Following my theory of borderland consciousness, which I see as an evolution, uh, evolutionary manifestation now um, of a new kind of consciousness that's coming in to the collective, uh, my focus is much more on what's happening in the outer world mm, okay. and how to understand that through a Jungian lens. Mm -hmm. So that's where my focus is now. Even though I work with individuals, and of course when I do, the focus is there on whatever it is they bring mm -hmm. and what they need. But what I'm writing about these days is much more what's happening in the collective world. Oh, good. Most particularly global climate change. Yes. Because uh, people very often confuse... Um, the syndrome with the symptom. 
So in very simple terms, if you have somebody with a very high fever, that's a symptom. Mm -hmm. uh, the syndrome can be a lot of things. It could be it could be pneumonia, it could be the flu, it could be uh, septicemia, it could be a whole bunch of things. And in the collective, the big issue before us now is global climate change. Mm -hmm. And that's seen as the syndrome, but it's really a symptom. A symptom, yeah. The syndrome is what I call, I'm sorry, what Jung called, and I'll come back to that in a moment, what Jung called a um, collective disorientation, this is a quote, okay. collective disorientation and dissociation yes. of the Western world. Yeah. And he wrote that mm, 1960, thereabouts, last year of his life, mm -hmm. where he was much more concerned about what was going on in the outer world. Um, and, uh, and he was rather despairing yes. uh, about the future. Yeah. And um, because his, his theoretical frame enabled him to see and understand the dynamics of what was going on. But he didn't he didn't have the kind of experience personally that he needed in order to figure out how to adapt his theories to the outer world, how to make them work out there. So his diagnoses were very accurate. Like when he said, the Western world is suffering okay. from a disorientation, dissociation. It's quite accurate. Mm -hmm. But what do you do about it? Right. And that's where the Jungian collective falls down. Okay. And, um, and that's, I used to be pretty critical mm -hmm. of our collective for that. But then uh, in the last mm, five, ten years, what I've, what I've come to realize is most people who go into Jungian training aren't looking at the collective. They're looking at working with individuals. Yeah. And their experience is working at that level on, on a, um, mm, a healing level with individual people. They don't come from government. They don't come from um, any of the political science areas. They don't come from... Um, mm, well, some do from sociology, but most people in sociology stay at that level. And they stay at the group level, and um, they just don't have the experience. My, um, my first book, um, which got published in 89, um, is called Power and Politics. And... What it was about was I reframed the Cold War mm -hmm. through a Jungian lens. Mm -hmm. And um, what was unique about the book was that if you, at the time, taking Jungian theory and saying, okay, what would the Cold War look like through this lens, through this theoretical lens, the picture that it generated was pretty much exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. um, and I started giving lectures on this in 1982, which was at the height of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And uh, what what happened, as we know, was that the Soviet Union collapsed from within, mm -hmm. and um, and it was an internal transformation, and the Cold War was an internal transformation, and because. People didn't have any way, when I say people, I mean political scientists and government people and, and uh, that whole ilk in the media. Because they didn't have another way of understanding it, they saw it as uh, victory and defeat. Okay. The West won and the Soviet Union lost. Um, which um, 
uh, how to put it, it's an archaic way of looking at it, and it misses the forest for the oh, for the trees. Okay. Um, because everybody was happy, our team won. Mm -hmm. um, but what actually happened for about a year and a half after the Cold War collapsed, which nobody expected, mm -hmm. nobody mm -hmm. expected, politicians, government, media, everybody said, uh, that's amazing. Uh, who would have thought? And um, <clears throat> nobody expected. This went on for about a year and a half. And then one day, I was um, in the Reagan, I think, Reagan administration. Uh, one day they woke up and they said, we won. And declared victory and went home. And... Um, and so some of the new shoots that began to grow as a result of the collapse of the Cold War psychologically between uh, what was left of the Soviet Union and the United States. For example, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, there was all of these nuclear warheads mm -hmm. and nuclear missiles and uranium and stuff. And the Soviet Union really was a collection of countries Mm -hmm. that had been put together. And so the missiles and the warheads were scattered mm -hmm. in all of these former Soviet republics, mm -hmm. which now became independent mm -hmm. with the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the biggest collection of um, nuclear material and warheads and so forth was in the Ukraine, mm -hmm. which was now an independent country. Mm -hmm. And George Bush, the first George Bush, uh, had the wisdom to negotiate uh, with Ukraine and Russia uh, to manage. We played, and this is not well known, but it's well documented, uh, to manage the control of those missiles, nuclear submarines, right. all of that, which were just out there. Mm -hmm. And so... If you had an ISIS, for example, uh, in one of those republics where everything had collapsed, it, you know, the real worry on the part of this country, which it should have been, I mean, much of the credit of George Bush, uh, was that it wouldn't be that hard to steal that material. Right. And so, so there was a big negotiation to... Uh, to organize it, and a lot of that material was shipped to this country okay. to be neutralized. And what my point is here, it's not politics. My point is psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> the kind of psychology that, that currently exists in... Um, in political science and government and so forth is, it has some relevance, but it's pretty archaic. Most of it has to do with analyzing personality of leaders. Uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, terrorism, which should be, I mean, it's all important. All of that's important. But for example, Jung's theory of the collective unconscious and what drives it's not just the leaders of the country, it's not just the individuals, but it's the archetypal dynamics that move um, the collective psyche, to put it that way. It's happening right here in this country. Right. So, so what is Trump about? Trump is about, you know, we can focus on Trump, and he's, he's very entertaining in, in, a, in a morbid way. Um, and he's a showman. Uh, I think he's more dangerous than, than Stalin or Hitler. Uh, and at the same time, I think he's a very, very important figure. I think it's really essential that he be president right now. Yeah. I couldn't bring myself to vote for him. But I really <laughs> think it's essential. Mm -hmm. Because if we think about it, um, no one... I would say probably in the history of the country, but certainly no one in, in memory 
no politician in memory has raised more consciousness than Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. He takes our shadow and thrusts it right into our face. Mm -hmm. And in a way that we can't dress it up, uh, we can't make nice, we can't even lie about it very mm -hmm. well. He's the most effective liar I can think of. Um, uh, <laughs> the straight politicians and um, people of that elk are not very good liars. And uh, it doesn't work well, as we can say. Mm -hmm. And so um, what I think Trump is about, and now I'm circling back to uh, Jungian theory, Jung's theory of the collective unconscious, there's no other, nowhere will you find a theory like that where archetypal dynamics move the, the collective psyche. So if we stand back, and, and th that's why I mentioned my book on the Soviet Union, yeah. because what I did was I stood back and I looked at the dynamics and said, okay, from a union lens, what does it look like is happening over there? Mm -hmm. And what it looked like was that the United States and Soviet Union were shadow images of each mm -hmm. other. And being that, and being unconscious, they kept projecting onto each other. Yeah. And it's a long, long story about why the Soviet Union collapsed. Anybody interested can read the book, but that's history now. But what's really important, um, well, I'll finish about Trump and then I'll circle back. Okay. I think what, what Trump is, is an agent. I, did I send you that piece uh, from a political panel that I was on? Yes. Yeah. So I see Trump as an agent of the collapse of the, uh, of the dominant political paradigm that's been operative in the 20th century. Yes. Since, uh, well, one could say since the end of World War I, um, uh, splitting that here is not crucial. But it's the predominant political paradigm that's been operating uh, in the 20th century uh, up until now. Okay. And entropy, now moving into physics, mm -hmm. entropy is a fact of life. Yes. Um, it's one of the laws of physics. Mm -hmm. Entropy is. It doesn't make any difference how you feel about it, what right. you think about it. It's like, if you're going to live, you're going to breathe oxygen. If we're going to be in this world, we're going to experience entropy. And entropy is, is the shift of energy. <clears throat> so hot coffee gets cold. Uh, machines, even when you don't use them, break down. Yeah. It has to do with gravity. That's the nature of science, of life, of physics. And... We tend to separate uh, between science and psyche mm -hmm. as though they're two different dimensions, one not having much to do with the other. It's a continuum. So if we, if we hold to evolution, say biological evolution, which most people do, um, from my point of view, that includes psychic evolution. Okay. But the difference is psychic evolution happens much, much, much more rapidly than mm. biological, ev biological evolution. Right. You're talking thousands of years. Psychological evolution, if you think about it, just for a moment, right. Freud wrote <clears throat> um, his book on dreams yeah. in 1900. Yeah. Okay. That's 120 years ago. Look at where psyche has come from in 120 years. I mean, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing. Yeah. Uh, and how many schools of psychology there are in the world? Dozens uh, in 120 years. Right. I mean, the evolution of psyche is very, very rapid. Why? It's a good question. You have to ask Psyche. Okay. Right. I don't know. <laughs> um, but, but your question, why? 
raises another um, another really interesting question. In 19, uh, let me get it straight. In 1923, I think it was, Jung wrote an essay called uh, Mind and Earth. And, um, and what you have in that article, it's 1923 or 24, what you have in that article is uh, very classical Jungian theory. I mean, it's, it's very textbook. But it's important to remember that Jung, Jung was 80, let's say he was born in 1875 and died in 61, so 83, 84, something like that, when he died. <clears throat> so it's a long span yeah. of his work. So in that in that initial initial, it was, uh, it was quite a ways into his right. theoretical formulations. But in that essay, yeah, very classical Jung, and it's it's almost uh, in the model of Freudian mm -hmm. theory, almost. Mm -hmm. And in it, he talks about psyche and the way that the vast majority of people still talk about psyche, which from my perspective is, is more towards the Freudian right. uh, model. And then in 1925, I think that's right, he wrote another essay. So the point is one's on the heels of the other. Mm -hmm. He wrote another essay called Archaic Man. And in that essay, he poses what I think is an earth-shaking question that he himself didn't answer. Mm. And the question was, does psyche originate in us, humans, or does it originate outside of us and we gradually take it in and become uh, come to realize that we are products of psyche as opposed to the producers of psyche. Does that make sense? Yeah. Figure and ground, which to me is today, today, right now, one of the most crucial questions there is. Go back to Donald Trump. Donald Trump would say, well, obviously psyche emanates from me. I'm president. <laughs> and, 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 we, you know, he will tell us 20 times a day in a thousand tweets how everything emanates from him and he's the best and all of that. I mean, that's, that's a very pathological ver <laughs> version. But the other is what he is an agent for, what he is um, channeling, so to speak. Mm -hmm which is the demise of the psychic paradigm, collective psychic paradigm that's been operative for the last hundred years. And another law of physics is you can't have two things occupying the same space at the same time. So if something new is going to enter in, something that was there has to exit. And that's what's happening. Yeah. The, the paradigm that has been is collapsing. Trump is the agent of that. He's, he's got a wrecking machine out there. And literally, you pick up newspaper any day, he's getting rid of these regulations and changing that law and stopping this. And he's, he's a wrecking machine. And he's wrecking that paradigm, which is a horrific experience. You know, it's, nature is nature. Yeah. Uh, so you get earthquakes that are horrific experiences if you live through them. Uh, on the one hand, and they're indispensable in terms of making life corrections or corrections in, 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 the, in, the, in the structure of the earth. Now, the earth is sort of repositioning itself mm -hmm. um, as needs be. Uh, concurrent with nature's laws, not our laws. Right. Earthquakes are very inconvenient if we could outlaw them and Trump may get to that. So nature's laws as opposed to our laws 
Right. Yeah. Right. And psyche is part of that. Yeah. Psyche is, psyche is part of nature. And that is at the very core of the paradigm shift. Right. Because we have operated as if our psyche, which I call the dominion psyche, mm-hmm. has absolute power and that we can change the laws of nature, that we can make science do what we want it to do, and that we can take everything natural in life and make it subservient to ourselves. And do you think we've gotten to this place because of our lost connection with nature? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's that's what borderline consciousness is about. But we say it the way you just said it because of the loss of our connection to nature. And in saying that, and the problem is the nature of our language. We don't have another way of saying mm-hmm. it. But in saying that, we're saying nature's out there. Yeah. And so if we get a, an electric plug and plug in, mm. then we'll be fine. Nature will be over there. We'll be over here. We'll plug it in. We'll get what we need. Right. And then we'll go about and keep on mm. destroying the earth mm-hmm. and wrecking the climate and all the things that we do. And nature should just stay over there and behave itself. And uh, what we're learning very rapidly, very rapidly, and of course all the, all the vast majority of scientists have concluded, is no such thing. And uh, nature, the laws of nature are no different than the laws of physics. And if we're going to survive, we're going to live within the law, we're not going to make it. And the latest reports uh, from the scientific community on global climate change is uh, they used to talk about a century. Mm -hmm. We don't have a century. We have 10 to 15 years. Um, That's when I say latest reports. I've checked on this in the last month. Mm -hmm. And uh, the most recent meetings of the major scientists doing climate control work have concluded that unless... Uh, we do some really, really drastic things in the next 15 years, we will cross a point of no return. And by the end of the century, life, uh, the planet won't be habitable for our species. So you say that global climate change is a symptom of us. The syndrome, yes, the syndrome is exactly what Jung said in 1960, which is collective dissociation and disorientation. So what do I mean by collective dissociation? Many, many people, not just scientists, but many, many people, including corporate people and investment people, and many people... uh, Matter of fact, polls, polls have recorded this. vast majority of people. Like, the last I looked, I think it was approaching 70% of the populace as a whole, mm-hmm. um, said that they believe that uh, the, uh, the analysis of the scientific community is accurate. Okay. That global change is real. It is crisis right now. Uh, that it it can result in the demise of the species, Mm -hmm. and that it's time-limited. Our species. Our species. Us, us, specifically us. And that it's Mm time-limited. The vast majority of people believe it. But how do we behave? Even even today, you know, when you, you turn on the news channels or you look at the paper... I don't do much on the computer in terms of news, mm-hmm. in terms of what's going on there, which, parenthetically, I think is a much more important domain. So do you think that. But notwithstanding that belief, people's behavior, we just went through, um, what is it, Black Friday after Thanksgiving, yeah. and then the, the sales before Christmas and the sales after Christmas, and consumerism and 
stuff, 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 yeah. stuff. And it's dazzling and wonderful. And I do some, I, I, I do some of that too. We all sure. do. Yeah. And uh, and where does it come from? Well, it comes from, you know, Arkansas or Michigan or wherever. And there's and that's where it that's where it stops. It doesn't go to the destruction of the earth. And what's going to happen? What I think about now. Mm-hmm is my children, but most particularly my grandchildren. Yeah. I have a one-year-old grandson. Mm. I have a 23-year-old granddaughter. Mm. But I have a one-year-old grands- grandson who, all I can say is 95% of his cells are joy. Mm. He is just... Uh, to be in his presence is to be cured of a lot. Mm. I mean, he's just joy and life and living. And that's what life, that dimension of life, uh, how to put it, if God had a reason to create life, it would be to experience mm. what, what that child carries. And of course, there are many other things there too that are unavoidable. That, that are not joy, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but there he is. And for me, when I think about global climate change and yeah. what I know about it and what I see going on, um, he's not going to make it. And there are not going to be more Isaacs. His name's Isaac. Yeah. There aren't. And to me... That is a crime against life itself. Mm-hmm. It is. It is. It's a crime against life. I, I don't know another way to put it. And so, for me, that's what drives me. And so, and one of the reasons it drives me is because I can see how Jungian theory is indispensable out there in dealing with climate change. The science is indispensable. Okay. We're not going to make it without the science. Okay. The science is also how we created it. Yeah. But notwithstanding, we are not going to make it without the science. Okay. The science is indispensable. But the syndrome, not the symptom, mm-hmm. the science deals with the symptom. The syndrome is what Jung said. It is the disorientation and collective dissociation of the human species, of us. So that even though we can see, I can sit here and describe to you in detail how this is, we're on a suicidal course. Mm -hmm. My own behaviors, still to this day, even though I really struggle with it, contribute to it. Right. That's the dissociation. Okay, for instance, you mean like we get into our truck that burns fossil fuels and yeah. drive yes. an hour to Taos. And yeah, or leave the lights on because it's okay. convenient. Okay. Or whatever. And, you know, a million things like that. A million like things, that. yeah. A million things like that. Uh, it's not any one act okay. or even any collection of acts. So you don't fly any... I'm, I, I have friends... I have a colleague in um, England, for example, who I asked to come over for a conference, and she said, appropriately, she's an eco-psychologist, she said very appropriately, I have to weigh getting on that airplane when I'm contributing to global climate change with that that contrail up there with what I'm going to be, what so-called good I'm going to be doing over there. And there's no answer to those questions. Right. Um, the the so-called answer is the struggle. It's the struggle with it. I'm I'm glad you mentioned that because that is something that my analyst reminded me of constantly, and I don't hear anybody talking about that. The benefit of the struggle. And whenever I try to relay that, it's I'm not, I don't do a good job. So. Most people don't take too kindly to me saying that 
that's a good thing, that right. they're struggling with something. Right. And yes, and that's our consumer culture where we have quick fixes mm -hmm. and everything will be all right if you take the right vitamin or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and it's dissociated. It's just, it's, 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 it's plain and simply not true. So is that our nature to be dissociated or to dissociate in order to survive? Uh, that gets into a very long story. Oh. I, 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 so, which I won't get into. It's in, the answer to the question is in Genesis. I'll just leave yes. it there. Okay. The Garden of Eden story. Yes. But to come back, your question was, is it in our nature? Um, yeah, it's in our dissociated nature. Oh, okay. And, uh, if, if we stand back, and, and a lot of, uh, for example, indigenous people, indigenous people will tell you that if you violate the earth, if you violate the native, I'm familiar with more with Native American cultures and language than other indigenous cultures, but I imagine what I'm about to say is true for all of them. The, the cultures that I know, Native American cultures, they don't have a word for nature. Mm -hmm. There's no word in their language for nature because we are not separate from nature. We're not. And so, so the word has no function, and therefore the word doesn't exist. So when you say it's in our nature, right. yeah, it's yeah. in our dissociated nature. Mm -hmm. That's the point. Mm -hmm. That's the part that's split off in dissociation. And that doesn't mean that we have to go back and become Indians. <laughs> it doesn't mean that. Okay. What it means is the, the core of, uh, of, I'll stick with Native Americans, ones I know, but the core of Native American practice, incidentally, they have no word for religion either. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the way one lives one's life in harmony with the rest of life is what's sacred, what's mm -hmm. needed. And so, so that whole domain is based on a principle of reciprocity, of maintaining balance. In Western way, we would say balance between um, our needs our perceived needs, and nature's. And so, um, and so, you know, simple, simple things. They're really, really destructive. Uh, mining, for example. Right. Um, if you look at mining, even, even as some of it is being essential, the way... It, the, the way mining takes place, blowing off the tops of mountains and, and destroying landscapes by leaving all of the mess from the mining and toxic materials that porters, uh, poisons the water and all of that, it's disrespectful. Right. And that's a concept that not only doesn't exist in Western way, but would mm -hmm. be laughed at. Uh, disrespectful. Look, you can get you can get the smartphone that you know for for very cheap cost. I can do all these wonderful things. What do you mean disrespectful? Yeah, you know you've got all all of the and nature's laws are nature's laws. They are laws. And what we're learning the hard, hard, hard way is disrespect of what we call nature is destructive to ourselves. We're, we're getting there pretty rapidly now mm -hmm. with the help of Trump. That's where my focus is. And my focus is taking union theory now out there into communities, into government, into educational institutions, into and adapting the union theory 
uh, to the specific problems, uh, which are the symptoms right. coming out of our dissociation, um, <clears throat> to enable more effective remediation is the word I use. I don't okay. use the word heal. I talk about remediation, rebalancing what is really off. And um, I'll say one other thing. Um, when my, in 1989, I won't go into uh, the history of, of uh, how it happened, but I ended up spending an afternoon in Jung's house um, with his son, mm -hmm. Franz Jung. And 1989, my first book, Power and Politics, came out. There was a book on the Cold War. And um, I had sent a copy to Franz Jung just as a token of a gift for inviting me to the house. Yeah. Never expected him to read it, but oh, he did read it. Did he? Which shocked me. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I said, what are you thinking? He, he's an engineer. Mm -hmm. So he, he had a more technical background. And he said he, he thought it was a really fascinating book, on and so forth. And then I asked him, you know, the, the big question, what do you think your father would think mm -hmm. about this book? And he said, my father would be amazed. Well, his response amazed me. I said, well, what would he be amazed at? Mm -hmm. And he said, the way you take his theories and adapt them into the real world out there, mm -hmm. he said, my father's frustration, and uh, during Jung's last few years, um, he spent a lot of time, uh, intimate time with his son, with Franz. He said, Jung's primary complaint was that after uh, the end of the World War, that many of the world leaders came to him, like there were meetings with Churchill and, and um, Alan Dulles and mm -hmm. leaders of big shots from around the world. And, uh, and they would come to me, and it was clear that they felt that Jung had something mm -hmm. That was really important that they needed. And, and when they came together, they couldn't talk to each other because they, the important people, didn't understand Jung's theories. Understandable, they're really right, hard. Right. And Jung didn't understand their world, how their world worked, how you get down to the nitty gritty. Yeah. Uh, you can you can understand when a car breaks down, it doesn't move, but what part? What are the parts that that result in that? Okay. That's a whole other story. And he said that was Jung's primary frustration at uh, the end of his life was that he himself, and I have a quote somewhere from Jung where he says that he would be the last person to know how to make that bridge. And um, and so when I look back on that experience, I realized that um, that in part through his son Franz, a message that I was getting because I do see how to do that, mm -hmm. and that's where my focus is now. I was wondering if you would tell us what you and I talked about very briefly on the phone. Jung was here for a very brief time, and visited Taos Pueblo, which is about an hour from here. And you said that he said something at the end of his life about mm -hmm. that brief, very brief encounter that he mm -hmm. had in Taos. Would you tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. that? Jung was doing some traveling uh, across the country, and some friends, associ associates, convinced him to pay a visit to Taos Pueblo, which he did. And that was uh, actually exactly this time of year, mm -hmm. precisely this time of year. I think his meeting with uh, Mirabal, the name of the elder that he met with, 
who in his autobiography he refers to as a Hopi. He was not a Hopi. He was Pueblo, but not Hopi. Uh, and whose um, native name was Mountain Lake. Mm -hmm. uh, that took place, I think, December 30th into December 31, or 31 into uh, January 1, 1926. So it was precisely this time of year. The entire contact was less than 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And I would say that that event, and, and, and all you need to do is read that chapter in Jung's autobiography, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. Um, there's a chapter in there about his visit to Taos. Mm -hmm. But that experience had more impact on Jung emotionally, psychologically, and theoretically. It had profound impact on his theoretical formulations more than anything else that occurred in his life, except his descent that he talks about in 1920. Mm, I forget the year, 23-ish. No, it's earlier than that. In any, what, what's written in the Red Book. Mm -hmm. But he had this... Um, he had this long, long conversation with Antonio Mirabal on Mountain Lake. And um, once you just read the chapter um, to see the impact it had on him, it's in Jung's words, and it was just profound down to his core. Um, that was 1925, let's say. So Jung died in 1961, June 1961. Mm -hmm. And that was 75, let's say, 1925, um, 25, 35, 37 years, roughly, later. Uh, during the last few months of his life, he had a correspondence with a friend uh, whose name is uh, Miguel Serrano. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's two volumes of Jung's letters. And in the second volume, there's a letter uh, from Jung responding to Miguel Serrano. And in that letter, what Jung says, now, uh, 40 years later, thereabouts, is, and this is almost verbatim what he says, what is needed in the world now is a... Um, is an experience of psyche similar to that which I which I experienced at Taos Pueblo. Now that time that he had with Mirabal was the only contact that Carl Jung ever had with a Native American. Mm -hmm. He went to Africa, he went to India, mm -hmm. he went to Australia. That's all there. Native American, that one incident less than 24 hours. Nearly 40 years later, at the very end of his life, what does he choose to say? What's needed is an experience of psyche. He didn't use that word, but experience of psyche. Mm -hmm. Similar to what he experienced in Taos Pueblo. So, although in in a cognitive way, he, he could not give a full analysis of what he did experience. He, he couldn't articulate that analytically, mm -hmm. but he knew it emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, um, in every sense of the word. Mm -hmm. And as he's dying, and really in despair about the fate and future of the world, what does he say we need? We need that kind of consciousness not instead of, I really want to stress that, mm -hmm. not instead of. In our culture, we tend to think in binary terms. So this is better than that. That's bad. This is good, black and white. That's not what Jung was saying. He's saying that the missing piece or the dissociated piece, mm -hmm. we could use that word, the dissociated piece is our cut-offness 
from that psychic dimension that he experienced in Taos Pueblo. Now, I do talk about that experience. Uh, one of the things Jung writes about earlier in his, in his theoretical frame is uh, something called participation mystique. Mm -hmm. And that's a concept that uh, was um, coined by Levi Brühl, mm -hmm. who was a French um, um, anthropologist. Uh, and Jung had a lot of respect for his work. It was really important work. And he talked about participation mystique, which I think is as close as Jung ever got to being able to understand cognitively what he was experiencing at Taos. Mm, okay. And um, there's um, a piece that I've written I'm, uh, there. Well, the piece that is published that anybody interested can get uh, to uh, see what that's about uh, is in a volume. What is the volume called? Shared Realities. Thank you. Yes, I interviewed Dr. Winborn in oh, episode, you did? Uh, episode six or seven for the podcast. Yeah. Oh, good. And you have a chapter in that book, which I'll link to on the website. Right, and which where I talk about participation mystique. And Jung's experience at Taos, I talk mm -hmm. about that in there. Mm -hmm. uh, I have another piece that's not published yet that um, I was asked to, uh, at the American Psychological Association convention a couple of years ago, they had a panel on um, major figures in American psychology who were influenced by natives, mm. by Native Americans. Uh, Maslow being one, Eric Erickson being another big names in psychology. And I was asked to do the piece on Jung mm -hmm. and uh, um, uh, Mountain Lake's influence. Oh, wow. And that will be published? Yeah. In their journal? I think in APA journal, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I first visited Taos in 1996. I was in analysis of time but I had no idea that Jung had been to Taos mm -hmm. and my first visit to Taos I did visit Taos Pueblo I didn't know anything about it it was all new to me I felt such a deep connection I've been back dozens of times since then the deepest connection I feel more so than to my own homeland I feel at Taos Pueblo and then I was just amazed to learn years later that Jung was there and, and when I started reading his work. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I feel it. I feel it, too, and have been very affected by my time there and the interactions that I've had there. And that's another reason why I connected with your book, Living in the Borderland, and saw a lot of myself in that book. And just going back to what you were talking about in the beginning about diagnosis and the different schools of psychology, and I talk about this a lot on the podcast, that cognitive behavioral therapy is the most popular form of therapy in this country. Why? Because it's fast, it's cheap, it's quick. I have to say that I think Please. cognitive behavioral therapy does have a really important place. It's not the universal cure-all. Okay. That's the problem, is we... In our culture, we need quick fixes. We're, we're not good at uh, delayed um, gratification, gratification. <laughs> we're just not. Mm -hmm. And, oh, which reminds me, I want to say something about addiction. Okay. But CBT, uh, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, mm -hmm. is very valuable, uh, as particularly, particularly, as an adjunct therapy with psychodynamic therapy. Okay. Jungian is, Jungian is one psychodynamic therapeutic school we mm -hmm. can look at. And it's particularly valuable, say, with certain syndromes, such as uh, bipolar disorder. Um, it can, uh, it's indispensable in some cases in dealing with... Um, uh, some specific uh, trauma. I'm talking about physical trauma. Okay. Um, so I would knock it. But 
it's just like Jungian psychology. Jungian psychology isn't the answer to everything either. Mm. And uh, and and we have to be we have to be sensitive to what works and what doesn't, and uh, also what um, how to put it um, when you when you uh, amalgams bringing mm-hmm. different treatment modalities together, okay. which is which is the challenge right now. It's the big 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 challenge in climate uh, dealing with the climate crisis uh, because what we've what we've had up until now still is a one-sided thing that'll fix all I, I was talking to a major scientist in uh, the field of climate change recently and um, and he said, that's the thing with scientists. You know, um, I asked him why scientists aren't out in the streets, mm-hmm. you know, marching, yeah. saying, hey, guys, you know, this is no joke. Right. You know, we're, we're talking about a dozen years here. That ain't much time. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, what I see is scientists publish their papers and, and they go home. Some of them get depressed, like the guy I was talking to really struggles a lot because he, he really gets it. And um, and he said, I, I, I asked him why they're so passive. And he said, because there's a lot of feeling of, well, science will fix it. Mm-hmm. So like CBT, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Right. Um, you know, just give them a little more time, need some more money, this, yeah. that, and the other, and it will be fixed. And no, no, it's indispensable, but it's not enough. Okay. Jungian theory is indispensable, not enough. Mm. And so bringing those uh, okay. disciplines together uh, to work, not necessarily, when I say together, I don't mean... Um, integrated per se Mm -hmm. but certainly in collaboration and one of the things science lacks is is any that's too strong science lacks uh, let us say a a deep enough appreciation Mm -hmm. of the need of the human spirit and the concept of reciprocity between life as we live it and nature's laws uh that if we do not have that balance, then we're not going to survive. And um, and that imbalance, that's what we do. We're the source of that. Which, <clears throat> I said addiction, mm-hmm. I want to say that um, what is diso- collective dissociation? 90% or more of addicts, whatever it is they're addicted to, mm-hmm. uh, know that they're addicts. Mm-hmm. It's not news to tell an addict that they're an addict. They know it better than anybody. So that's not the problem. The problem is how do you manage addiction, which is a psychosomatic, and I don't mean that as Mm non-real, but it is a body-mind problem Mm -hmm. of dissociation. Every addict knows they're an addict. They know why they're addicts. They know that if they take that next hit, whatever it is they're addicted to, they know what that means. Mm -hmm. They theoretically have the capacity, their their hands are not in handcuffs or robots that make them shoot themselves up. So one way of looking at that dissociation is our collective uh, addiction to a split-off materialism, consumerism, all of that stuff, Mm -hmm. the quick fix the not wanting to look at struggle, 
all of that's inherent, and it, and it's it really is a, a is a colossal uh, collective addiction, is what it is, and it's it and it's not unconscious. Well, that's not true. Every addict knows they're an addict. There are many many people in our collective society who don't realize that their behavior it's they'll agree with the scientists mm -hmm. but it's not me right and it's not that they're saying it's not me it's that they don't think whether it is or it isn't me it's a problem out there mm -hmm. and it's going to impact me but I don't have anything to do with it that's the dissociation mm -hmm. So I'll throw that in. Yeah. I also want to say, you began by talking about media, my, my word, mm -hmm. not your word. Uh, I use that word because I, I'm, I'm a modern technology that computers, uh, the, for example, I don't have uh, Twitter. Okay. Right. I, do, I do have <laughs> Facebook, but I don't know how to use okay. it. Okay. <laughs> You know, that's not me. Okay. But I do understand, I do understand that that is, that is certainly the future of media. It probably is, is right now. Right. And really, really uh, profoundly important in communicating yeah. in terms of collective disorder. Okay. As opposed to individual therapeutic work. Individual therapeutic work, the patient goes into the therapist's office, they sit down, they do what they do, and the patient leaves. Mm -hmm. On a collective level, it doesn't work that way. It's a constant, ongoing thing. I mean, Trump tweets more than probably any 300 people we know. And he has an audience of millions of people right. out there. Mm -hmm. And the things you were talking about in terms of retweeting, yes. I mean, simple concept, but I hadn't thought about it. And I think that's really, really important. So I think, I think what you're trying to do, which is to get the word out, and, yeah. and for me, that's, that's a lot more narrow than probably is the reality, simply because I don't see um, I'm not familiar mm -hmm. with how broad that is, but I think it's terribly important. So I just wanted to note that. So I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. Thank you. It's important. So, so there we are. There we are. Mm -hmm. I'd like to again thank Mr. Bernstein for graciously allowing me into his home. We spent a wonderful three hours together that I'll never forget. You can find links to all of the publications that were mentioned today, including the full text of some of Mr. Bernstein's papers, on our website, speakingofjung.com. There you'll also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to listen to or to download for free. The episodes are also available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and a whole host of other listening platforms which you can find links to on our About page. So with special thanks to the Navajo, Hopi, and Pueblo people 